Uh, I would like to thank the management team of uh, Jindal Stainless uh, for providing this opportunity to host them for the call. We have uh, from the uh, management side, we have Mr. Avitay Jindal, Managing Director, JSL and JSHL. Uh, Mr. Anurag Mantri, Group CFO of Jindal Stainless. Mr. Jagmohan Sood, the whole time director at Jindal Stainless SR. Mr. Ramnik Gupta, CFO of GSHL. Uh, Mr. Gautam Chakravarti and Ms. Shreya Sharma from the IR team at uh, JSL and GSHL. So without uh, much ado, I would like to hand over the uh, patent to Mr. Gautam Chakravarti for his opening remarks. Over to you, Gautam. Thanks, Vishal, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, we'll begin this call with the brief opening remarks and uh, following which uh, we'll be having the forum open for an interactive question and answer session. Uh, but before we start, I would like to state that the, some, of, some of the statements made in today's call uh, may be forward-looking in nature and a disclaimer in this regard is available in our results presentation that was shared with you earlier. I would now uh, like to hand over to the floor to Mr. Abhijay Jindal for his opening remarks. Thank you, Gautam, and good evening to everybody. Hope all of you are doing well with your family and friends. On behalf of the management team, I welcome you to the earnings call for Q4 and financial year, fiscal year 2022 of Jindal Stainless Limited and Jindal Stainless SR Limited. First, I would like to share the key highlights of Q4 FY22 and the full years following which Anurag will take you through our operational and financial performance. Stainless steel prices globally and in India remain firm in Q4 FY22 with improvement seen throughout the financial year 2022 backed by strong demand. Stainless steel production in calendar year 21 grew by an impressive 11% year on year to 56.2 million tons. The underlying raw material prices remained extremely volatile during the quarter. Nickel prices went up by 33% and ferrochrome increased by 17% in Q4 FY22 on a year-on-year year basis. In this backdrop, I am happy to share that our robust performance continues in, the, in Q4 as well, on the back of adaptive strategies in supply chain and product basket management. Despite volatility and global disruption in raw material supply and logistics, JSL's exports doubled to 32% in Q4 FY22, on a year-on-year -year basis, while export proportion from GSHL more than doubled to 18% in Q4 FY22 from 8% uh, in Q4 FY21. Key domestic sectors like elevators, escalators, uh, railways, which includes wagons, coaches, metros, continue to register a steady demand. Under our local to global initiative, we are in the process of providing customized product solutions for international operations for select domestic customers having a global presence. We have also supplied various critical grades like super duplex and cobalt restrictive stainless steel for various uh, nuclear applications and key fertilizer projects. Sales volume in the specialty product division rose by 32% this year. And continuing with this trend, we have achieved highest ever total sales in the blade steel and precision uh, strip segment during Q4 FY22. In this context, in this context, I am happy to share uh, with you that the first stainless steel footover bridge in the country were commissioned in Naupada, Andhra Pradesh. Other than being key raw material supplier, JSL also played a major role in developing the ecosystem. Another major development, JSL became the first integrated stainless steel manufacturing company in India to get certified with AS 9100D certification a quality management system for aviation, space, and defense organizations. The certification validates JSHL's competence to constantly meet high stringent standards of the aerospace industry. We are happy that our shareholders and creditors have approved the scheme of arrangement for the merger of JSHL with JSL by an overwhelming majority. This is a testimony to the confidence that the merger is value effective for all stakeholders of both the companies. With this positive movement, we now expect other relevant processes to be complete in due time in the next six to seven months. On the import front, subsidized imports from China and Indonesia continued. As a result, imports from these two countries were estimated to have risen by 147% and 280% respectively in FY22 over FY21. 
This also resulted in the share of imports rising to 36% of demand in Q4 FY22 as compared to 24% in Q4 FY21. I am, also, I am happy to inform you that despite the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we have managed to fulfill our commitments without cancelling any orders. Also, sensing the factor of uh, Ukraine war and supply disruption in EU, we continuously focus on the U.S. market and did highest ever shipments. Our exports to U.S. increased three times during FY22. As I told you last time, we are strategically focused on reducing our carbon footprint. Our plan for exploring renewable energy and low-carbon energy transition are on track. We are proactively switching from thermal to renewable energy infrastructure at our plant and are working towards our goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. In our continuous efforts to create shareholder value, the board has approved modification in the existing dividend policy of the company that inter alia efforts will be made to target dividend payout up to 20% of tax of the company on a progressive basis in future. With this, I would like to hand over to Anurag to discuss the operational and financial performances. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijay. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to uh, a warm welcome on this call today. We have shared our investor presentation with the stock exchanges, and today's call and discussions will be around on the same lines. Operating performance has been robust despite many challenges, including high volatility in raw material prices, geopolitical tensions, and supply chain issues. Key segments such as railway coaches, wagons, metro and infrastructure have been doing well for us. As Abhijay mentioned, especially project division continue to achieve new heights. Our strategic decision to focus on export sales and strengthen its niche value added product portfolio enabled us to steer through the certain challenging segment in the domestic market and double our export proportions. On a combined entity basis, export stood at 21% of total sales in FY22 as against 15% in FY21. Let us look at the key operational and financial highlights of the quarter. On a year-on-year -year basis, the Proforma combined revenue and EBITDA for Q4 FY22 rose by 56% and 47% respectively to Rs. 9,724 crore and Rs. 1,296 crore. The pet of the same period was more than doubled to Rs. 1,022 crore. On a full year basis, the performance standalone combined revenue increased by 70% over FY21 to Rs. 32,620 crore. EBITDA almost doubled up to Rs. 4,740 crore, while PET grew more than 3x to Rs. 2,949 crore. <laughs> Along with the parent companies, performance of the operating subsidies also continues to be strong. The combined EBITDA grew 88% on year-on-year -year basis to Rs. 143 crore in Q4 FY22. For the full year FY22, the combined EBITDA of the operating subsidies rose 2.5x over previous year to Rs. 418 crore. Raw material prices remain volatile throughout the quarter as we have seen, same, we have seen some extreme fluctuations in the month of March. The average prices of the LME nickel in Q4 FY22 rose by 33% over Q3 FY22, while domestic ferrochrome average prices in Q4 FY22 fell by 6% over Q3 FY22. Our focused risk management practices helped us to mitigate the underlying commodity risk to a large extent and continue to have a steady uh, margin. At the end of FY22, our Proforma combined entity net debt stood at Rs. 3,162 crore, which is down by 33% as against March 21 level. Leverage ratio has been consistently improving. The Proforma debt equity and debt EBITDA ratio stood at 0.3 and 0.7 respectively. With the fall in our borrowing rate, the combined interest cost declined by 33% and 47% in Q4 and FY22 to Rs. 74 crore and Rs. 327 crore respectively. For the full year FY22, the interest cost stood at just 1% of the combined revenue. Prudent financial management with focus on balance sheet improvement will continue going forward. For both companies, the rating, uh, credit rating for long-term facilities remains at AA-, minus, while the short-term at A1+. Plus. The highest rating has been maintained by both the companies. 
With a strong growth, uh, business outlook, we expect further uh, improvement in our long-term credit facilities rating. Maybe, uh, as you are, uh, are aware, that I'm, but I am glad to let you know that JSHL has now become a part of the Nifty Metal Index in the month of March. As a company, we will continue to explore on new business opportunities while strengthening our existing base. We are confident that our robust product portfolio along with strategic geographical presence Focus on uh, capital allocation for balance sheet improvement and improving shareholder value will continue. Well, this brings to the end of my discussion. I would like now request moderator to open the floor for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Also, please limit your questions to two per participant. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question comes from Amit Dixit with Edelweiss. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations for a good set of numbers. I have two questions. The first one is essentially on our uh, sales mix. So if I see the domestic sales volume is down by a while, however, export sales have gone up two times. Now, what looks like that imports are taking away the incremental growth in the domestic market. Uh, now, uh, we have also seen that progressively protectionist measures for stainless steel industry are being diluted. So, how are we working with the government to ensure that our interests are protected? And in particular, we are coming up with new capacity. So, uh, will the new capacity be directed towards only exports because uh, Domestic market looks quite capped, at least as of now. I mean, considering the uh, influx of imports. Thanks, thanks, Amit, for your uh, question. So yes, it's a continuous uh, process with the government, you know, to uh, keep showcasing that how much imports are coming in and how the industry is being hurt uh, by it. So just recently, uh, Steel Minister and his full top senior team had visited our Jadpur plant and there we really in detail discussed with them uh, and he has committed to take it up very strongly internally within their own systems, uh, you know, and we are uh, constantly anyway approaching uh, TRU and finance uh, department that what has done is really hurting the industry side. There is definitely some uh, positive response. They are also aware of the fact that uh, it is China that is the main, uh, uh, you know, importer into the country and we are supporting more Chinese companies. So they are cognizant of that fact, but uh, will some immediate step be taken? That I cannot commit, uh, but the way the company is now working is that if there are some protectionist measures or not, we will still like to maintain our position and we would like still like to maintain our uh, sort of uh, average margin that we have been uh, you know, talking about and uh, giving a commitment for. And to your second question, the second question was on exports. What was, sorry, if you can repeat the second question. Uh, no, the second part of the question was on essentially the capacity expansion we are coming mm -hmm. up with. So, you know, uh, what would be, will it be directed towards export majorly? Because, you know, domestic market uh, looks quite sure. capped in view of uh, imports. Maximum volume would still be consumed in the domestic market itself because we don't want to lose our uh, market share that we have. But yes, the proportion of export would be increasing uh, coming when the capacity addition comes up. And uh, I mean, going forward, domestic market also, as you have seen last uh, few years, uh, we have uh, seen the import competition is more onto the commoditized product range. But certain simultaneously, there is a a uh, little slow pace of the approval based segment, but that's also growing faster. So, uh, 
So as the car capacity expansion also come as Abhijay mentioned, our aim is that irrespective to the geographies and irrespective to the segment, how we actually penetrate these uh, high-end segments. So that we will continue. So domestic market also the uh, uh, approval based and high quality segments are also increasing their demand gradually. Okay. So the second question is essentially on JUSL uh, blast furnace expansion that is 2 MTPA there it is I mean we reported that they are putting up 2 MTPA blast furnace so just wanted to understand the relative economics of uh, of producing stainless steel with hot metal and mild steel scrap uh, and uh, can you give us the comfort that JSL or JSHL will not support the CAPEX in any way through ICD or any you know buying any equity stake directly as a company in JUS. Okay, um, uh, so I'll take this question, uh, this is Sujit. So the first question is uh, how this uh, fits into this, uh, you know, the hot metal, whether it is melting into the whole scheme of the thing or not. So just let me tell you that stainless steel, by and large, they consist of almost 70 to 85% of the iron component, that you know. And this iron component is being used from different sources, different, you know, variants. Sometimes it is scrap, sometimes it is, you know, combined with nickel. So in different series, it is a different kind of a, you know, a variant we are using. So, uh, largely speaking, about 200 and 400 series of stainless steel where it is being planned to be used. The raw material which we are consuming is uh, currently carbon steel scrap, okay? If this carbon steel scrap always, uh, you know, tends to have a parity with the hot metal. When this material, the raw material in the form of hot metal turned into liquid steel, when it is used in stainless steel, it brings in a huge uh, advantage in terms of, you know, number one, productivity, number two, the cost. Cost-wise, it is cheaper uh, by almost 4,000 rupees per ton. It gives that advantage uh, in the cost. So, using hot metal turned into liquid steel, into the stainless steel, definitely brings in uh, uh, advantage in terms of cost, and second biggest advantage it brings in is the quality. Since this hot metal turned into liquid steel always have a very low phosphorus content and other cramped elements, which actually, you know, uh, give impetus in terms of better quality, you know, better properties in the, uh, you know, end product, and this gives huge advantage in terms of, you know, uh, various uh, applications where this steel is being used, stainless steel is being used. This is how actually this happens. Okay, and the second part of the question that, oh, you know, second part of the question, uh, yeah, I mean, I take the second part of the question. So basically, uh, the, as Mr. Sood mentioned, this is really basically for focusing on the 400 series and 200 series where the nickel content is low, where it's uh, always better to use, uh, there are cost efficiencies, not always, I would say there are cost efficiencies which come from this. So, uh, for, from JSL perspective, there is no corporate, corporate guarantee which has been given to JUSL. Just let me clarify that uh, thing uh, for that. There is no uh, obligations which have been given. We also have a 26% stake in JUSL. So, corresponding to our requirement, we will have only that much of uh, uh, corresponding to our stake, which matches with uh, more or less what we are doing for 400 series and 200 series is close to 500 to 600,000 tons. That is what our requirement for the, from last furnace route. So we will be only obliged to work that, that much of part and that is only our, our, our limited to our 26% stake of the, in JUSL. Otherwise JUSL and JCL separately are getting merged. JCL has uh, both of, uh, so JUSL has an excess uh, hot strip mill capacity right now which they have been also generating uh, the carbon steel tolling revenue. JCL uh, itself has been uh, generated a good cash in last uh, two years because of uh, good dream run on the book. So they have their own uh, surpluses also available and they will funding uh, through their own uh, resources. It will be a combination of debt and equity finally. Okay, so our contribution would be to the extent of 26% only, any financial contribution? Yes, that uh, will be limited to only that first part. And equity part only. We won't be extending any intercorporate debt or something to support them. 
uh, it will not be in fact uh, corporate debt uh, debt like this means uh, it will be uh, like depending on their uh, how they fund the overall pattern uh, accordingly that's why i'm saying overall their project uh, with our requirement which is just 600000 will all be contributing 26% now see uh, they uh, on intercompany deposit let me tell you this way i think there are the security deposit which are there for the tolling arrangements so which are actually uh, in in uh, already with us but uh, that is only for the commitment of these lines to us because they have been doing carbon steel tolling also so prioritization is being given for jsl for that part so it's only to that extent that we will not be putting any other large icds towards that okay thanks uh, great that so that's it i will come back in the queue and all the best. thank you the next question is from the line of ritesh shah with investec please go ahead first uh, operational performance i particularly had a few questions uh, pertaining to blast for us first is uh, what is the rationale of having this incremental capex at jusl and why not at jsl uh, that is one uh, secondly what i picked up is you indicated that uh, the usage will be only to the excess of 600 kt uh what sort of economic benefit are we looking at it over here what is a potential capex uh, if you can guide for some number uh, that that's the first question sir so uh i think uh, it is let me just answer i think first, first question is why in this capex in jusl and not in jsl right uh yes sir right so uh, see let me answer that question because the uh, our as i said you that uh, we when we looked at uh, the smaller blast furnace uh, putting in jsl was not getting optimal getting any of the right optimization level because then it would have been a much uh, not a right optimized capex and would got have got to a much higher uh, cost uh, cost on to us as well as operational cost the that the region uh, we thought that the optimized uh, blast furnace can only be put up on the jusl because that's the region jusl decided because they as part of our since we are increasing the capacity they are anyway uh, aligning with their for increasing the hot strip mill capacity also simultaneously so besides our requirement then they get into their own carbon steel so uh, carbon steel arrangement separately so that the region they will be putting up a, they they are evaluating to put up an appropriate size blast furnace and jus so jsl that's for that the region smaller blast furnace doesn't make economic sense for jsl because our requirement for this uh, type of blast furnace is largely for 400 series and partly for 200 series as mr sud mentioned 300 series uh, is always better to be done through a nick scrap route so that's uh, the question one uh your second question was uh, uh, can you repeat the second question right uh, so just to continue with the first question uh, uh why not at jsl uh, given eventually the plan was for also jusl to be merged into the parent entity uh, this might happen probably 3 years 5 years out uh, then this is something which is go to the operation then why not do it at the parent listed entity itself the uh, uh because the reason is that uh, the hot strip mill is currently over there uh, at uh, the uh, at uh, at jusl level and uh, eventually you are right at, at some point of time we have to integrate uh, the jus uh, this hot strip mill in jsl but at when they have their own uh, right uh, level of balance sheet ratios now if we do the this uh, glass uh, uh, another glass point is capex here and which out, out of which we see have a ideal capacity of blast furnace it will not be optimum size blast furnace for us so we'll have to add an ideal capacity of the blast furnace we'll have to find another utilization of that integratedly without hot strip mill we cannot have a carbon steel then in that case so it will be more uh, it will not be any economic sense for the doing the large blast furnace in jsl at all that's the reason jusl is uh, doing that capacity because they have integrated uh they have their own co co one because jcl is getting much they have a uh, hot strip mill uh that's the reason we can have a completely integrated play for the carbon steel or the 400 series sort of metal and we only use it on a tolling arrangement this is on need basis without any uh, large capex commitment towards it because right now there is no uh, we we don't want to commit a large capex in jsl right uh, sir if i had to ask you what is the current capital employed for jusl and what will be the approximate capex that we are looking at over here uh, i'm just trying to understand basically i'm just trying to understand if we had to merge both the entities if we were looking at like 3 years 3 years 4 years out 
uh, are we just not prolonging the time frame for the merger for the two entities? And again, from a conversion cost or from a related party transaction point of view, uh, don't you think that the market won't probably look at it in a more comfortable way? So uh, I think let me uh, just tell you from the related party perspective, these all these zoning arrangements were actually uh, defined by the lenders when we did a, did a split. And uh, it's completely on those lines and it's uh, fully in the public domain. Uh, there is no, and uh, all, every time we took a transparency, those approvals and it's consistent. So we are not changing that. I think that's uh, been consistent. We have, in fact, uh, to an extent, uh, even when we are will be now needing more uh, tolling, so they are increase, they are incurring the capex to increase their hot strip mill capacity. So uh, it will be uh, related party transactions are completely on arm's length and purely on an impact. Uh, they are doing outside carbon steel uh, tolling, so they have benchmarks against that. So and we can always take a cognizance of that. So from that perspective, we are surely at uh, some advantage from JUSN. Uh, because they are benchmarks, so they are doing not only for us, they are doing for other carbon steel players, separately, uh, separate tolling. So that's the reason is, uh, I hope this answers your question. Right. Asad, just last to conclude on the numbers, uh, I think what I picked up is uh, around uh, 5,000 rupees and 600 kt of volume, which essentially means the cost savings that we are looking at is around 300 crores. Uh, corresponding to this, what is the sort of capex that we are looking at? Is it upwards of 2,500, 3,000 crores? So how should one look at uh, the payback over here and what would it mean on the ESD? Specifically, we are going for PIGA and uh, I think won't, won't it increase the scope 1 and 2 emissions because uh, we tend to look at the entity together. See, uh, uh, Ritesh, uh, if I understand correctly, you are asking for from JUSL economic perspective? Uh, yes, sir. So if, if the incremental capex is, say, 2,500, 3,000 oh, crores, so what I could pick up from the data points what you gave uh, is 5,000 rupees per ton and 600 kt of volume. That broadly sums up to nearly 300 crores. So what is the sort of capex that we are looking to chase this cost saving of 300 crores? That's, that's the first question, sir. Oh, okay, uh, Ritesh, uh, let me answer this. Uh, the advantage what we are getting in the still is not what you are trying to deliver. It is 4,000 rupees on an average. You know, per ton of hot metal turning to liquid steel we are using into the stainless steel. Okay, so uh, what actually Amra had told, we are consuming up to 75% of this liquid carbon steel into stainless steel. So by this arrangement, we are able to consume on the current product mix, we are able to consume almost 0.6 million tons of hot metal turned into liquid steel. So that brings in almost, currently, uh, 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 largely speaking, about 250 crore rupees uh, per annum. That is the, you know, advantage we get in the clear set. Over the, you know, current set of parameters, what we are using in the form of a scrap or low cost uh, scrap, this is the advantage we get in uh, GSS. Uh, sure, sir. I, I just had one last question for Abhuda, if it's possible. Sir, if you are deploying this sort of capex, I don't know the number, 2,500, 3,000 crores, won't it be fair for us to go and chase a nickel mine or a chrome ore mine somewhere else, uh, wherein the cost advantage could probably far, be far more superior? So, Rite, that's a very good question, and this was actually deliberated a lot. And uh, if you see that there is no chrome ore asset available within the country itself. That would have been definitely our priority. And uh, we were in, the, in a big fight with uh, Tata's also when these mines in Sukinda were uh, being auctioned off. And we went up to a very high percentage level. But after and the price that Tata took it, it became unviable for us also. You know, so that was definitely our priority. Uh, nickel mines, we have gone in the past, we have burnt our fingers. So to really protect our EBITDA margins, to really give more value addition to our shareholders, we felt that this was the uh, best possible investment that we could do. And second thing that, you know, what uh, what uh, is a big operating leverage that is that we have created is that to set up a standalone carbon steel project of this size, uh, on average it costs around 6,000 to 7,500 crores. You know, but our investment would not be more than 3,000 crores, less than 2,500, uh, than 2, to create uh, full carbon steel setup at a 2 million ton level. 
you know so that is why we felt that it was is definitely a big investment uh, but looking at the company's financials looking at our JUSL and uh, JCL are actually have uh, got margin as I told you that JCL JUSL have a good cash accrual uh, run because of uh, dairy not only us because JCL also actually only 25% material is sold to us otherwise 75% goes to outside market and because of uh, the uh, run they have in the past so there is a good cash accrual uh, in those two companies so per se there was no even from a M&A perspective there was no stainless steel asset that was really available uh, or even a carbon steel asset also we looked at you know but they were much bigger and much more expensive than what the company could take up so investing into our own setup uh, which gives of clear benefit coming in tender side which is why this decision was taken it was after a uh, uh, long term deliberation only and see as i mentioned that we are not committing uh, any large capex in jsl for for this purpose that was the idea not to have a, because uh, those are stand alone companies and they will have their own funding arrangements sure sir so sir, just to conclude so we are looking at jusl probably as a carbon steel entity the listed entity will continue to be stainless steel and uh, should one presume that esg will actually take a back seat uh, given if we look at scope 1 and 2 together no i i wouldn't i wouldn't really say that it would take a back seat because we are making uh, a stainless steel anyway has you know a uh, uh, leg up over carbon steel and we are investing heavily into esg right now you know it's not only from environment side in in esg there's also social and there's governance as well so you will see us investing heavily into all three aspects of the business see, uh, thank you so much thank you next question is from rajesh mazumdar with bnk sec please go ahead sir yeah thank you for the question and congratulations for giving uh, certain numbers so sir uh, i actually had a couple of questions uh, on the product mix in the modern side Uh, one was that we have been talking a lot about the infrastructure series going up to a certain percentage level because of the uh, greater scope of the government. But if you look at the numbers in Q4, only 22 percent shares in the quarter were seen, and uh, exports have gone up substantially. So is this something which is uh, a little bit alarming in terms of our product mix change at the quarter mix level? That was my first question. is uh, rajesh your question is that series by 400 series is not move much uh, is this your question yeah that's right that's right yeah broadly that's the question yeah see uh, overall uh, uh, our focus continues to remain uh, the 400 series uh, to do all the 400 series mix and which is gradually increasing and with auto railways and all these are actually consuming that uh in a intermittent early uh, as we explained earlier that idea is to get the best margin uh, orders first and get it booked so some of the exports market where we do the some of the high end to us and europe that was also a large 300 series order some of the orders were catered so uh, strategic direction is very clear that it's to uh, continue to grow 400 series which is also matching with the the way countries demand in particularly our addressable market segments are going going and uh, but in the intermittently obviously we don't want to lose the size on because we have a flexibility to build uh, any uh, kind of product range for any segment that's actually giving us the advantage to capture the best margin order at that particular point of time so idea is not to just in a set, uh, focus on a strategic direction not to uh, dilute on the margins and leave away some of the best margins order at that particular point of time and you know because of this nickel volatility that we are seeing uh it's a natural extension that demand from consumer side in 400 series is also going to pick up you know so that way uh from uh, q4 last year to q4 this year definitely 400 series has has increased by i think 5 to 6% and naturally it says you will see by uh, natural consumer demand and the effort company is making that every quarter on quarter 400 series will pick up So you don't see any kind of slowdown in terms of government spending because we've been hearing talk that uh, no fertilizer subsidies are going up and the inflation trends, uh, crude oil going up so high, uh, government expenditure can be coming off slightly. 
Uh, are you seeing any kind of trend which might prompt us to believe that over the next uh, couple of quarters also exports will remain high? No, we are not seeing that and one of the strengths of our organization is that we are very flexible and we are not dependent on any one particular segment to a very large extent. So, uh, like we mentioned, if domestic market uh, being open to imports, we will increase our exports. Similarly, if government projects, some of them which at least in our case have not really been cancelled or delayed, uh, you know, we can easily switch over to any other segment. So, that is uh, one of the USPs of our organization. Right. So, I didn't hear anything from you in terms of guidance for EBITDA per ton. Uh, is there any change or what are we likely to see in the next coming quarters? See, uh, EBITDA per ton, Rajesh, uh, long term we have always been consistent in our guidance that at this stage, uh, till the time new expansion uh, is completely unfolds, say 18 to 20,000 is our average guidance. Uh, Right now, for the near term in quarter one, I think uh, it will be close to more at 24,000 runs, 22 to 24,000, uh, what we expect, uh, though there are much of volatility in terms of power cost and all this thing, but with all these volatility, we are expecting to uh, have that type of run rate in quarter one in near term. And uh, the benefit from a slow more mines will be coming in this year? Uh, can we expect that to come in because we've been talking about it? Uh, Okay, okay. I think uh, the chrome ore operations will start within a uh, year time. That is common boundary mining, Gavit Tata and uh, the uh, unlocking. Right. So from next year almost. Yeah, almost next year, yes. By end of this so year. So that's like... So that will be in sync with our expansion more or less. Yes. Okay. Thanks, sir. I'll come back in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Abhijit Mitra with ICICI Securities. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thanks for taking my question. And uh, congrats on a great set of numbers. So I have uh, I have a few questions on, on the JUSL CAPEX. So just to sort of clarify the investment of 2,500 crores, it would be over how many years? Over two-year period. Two years, so FI 23 and FI 24. Okay, and and you know, assuming say a debt equity of 40s to 60 or 50s to 50, so JSL will sort of fund 25 or 26 percent of that. Is that the understanding? So anywhere between 250 to 350 crores. There's no, uh, see, there's no specific which has been confirmed because this project uh, is also still under the finalization at JUSL level. That how they will be unfolding this uh, because then they they have their own earning streams uh, also. So uh, it's not that it's, we'll, uh, we uh, what I'm saying is that broadly that uh, we will not get to any of the other beyond any other funding support beyond these levels. That's what our uh, broad uh, outer uh, outer target is. But uh, otherwise, it's not that we'll have to even fund from that perspective. It's not that. It's only that we'll have to ensure that our hotel, uh, what we need the tolling arrangement for uh, from their hotel signal, at least that is remain protected when we increase our capacity. Because uh, the, we have a, we are doubling our capacity, so we need those much of guarantees from the JUSL. At least those are actually remain protected because uh, they have their own outside tolling business also. Okay, so uh, so uh, you know, just two more questions on the tolling arrangement on the future tolling arrangement. Once the blast furnace comes up, what wh how will the tolling arrangement look like? So one is, of course, through the HSM that we are taking. We would also be buying the hot metal from them, right? And and for that, we will we supply iron ore and chrome ore and then buy the hot metal, or it will be just buying hot metal like you know purchasing pig iron from the market. How how will that be? See, this is not, uh, this is still, I'll, I'll let it list, last one is, is whenever they, uh, even when they start, it will at least be two, two and a half year away, two years away at least. So those, we are not even uh, thought of those. Right now, our thing is that our tolling arrangement with JUSL will only be limited to our office truck mill capacity. So this is still uh, at least two financial year away. 
Okay, but you mentioned that 600 KT, 4,000 uh, rupees per ton. I thought you were referring to that, right? When you're sort of... No, no, it was only for the purpose of giving the economics that uh, what is... Uh, why we, uh, we, uh, we didn't put up the blast furnace in this? Because our requirement of blast furnace is not large. That's what the answer to that question, that our requirement is only limited to 400 series and some part of 200 series. Because uh, otherwise we will continue to focus on the scrap route. Only from those perspectives where we get a cost advantage uh, that uh, we, we wanted to leave with. So that was an answer to that question. It's not uh, it, the, because there is no uh, capacity available in JUSL right now for this purpose. So it's at least two years away when they start when they even start uh, working on this. Okay. Okay. Okay, and, so and uh, last... From them also, that effects outflow they will also not be uh, uh, immediate, so they will also have their spread over to 24 months at least. So they, by the time they will have next two years earnings of their own uh, thing also. Right, right. So what what is the current year EBITDA for JUSL and JCL? If you can tell me, and what is the combined net debt that it's looking at? End of FI22. Uh, since this call is on JSL, I think uh, I, we can, uh, Gautam and Shreya, I think can give you a bit of those numbers for JSL. It's not right for us to comment on those uh, numbers, but we can, I think uh, they can help you out with those numbers. Sure, sure. I'll take it from them. Great. Thanks. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Chetan Shah with Abacus. AMC. Please go ahead, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks. Just uh, one small uh, uh, clarification. Uh, uh, for the current year, what is the volume growth for the combined entity we are expecting? Uh, I believe on a TV we said about 18 to 20 percent growth. No, so I heard it right. 23, uh, we will not have much volume growth because we are running almost at full capacity and most of the new capacities will be coming at the back end of this fiscal year in Feb March. So okay. this year we will probably end up with almost a flat growth because we don't have a capacity. But yeah. FY24 over 23, we, because new capacities will be coming at the end of this fiscal, so FY24 over 23 will be a good 20% plus growth. Okay, okay. Got it, got it. Thanks, Anurag. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Vishal Chandak. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks for taking my question, sir. Uh, I'm just continuing with uh, the JUSL and proposed JSL transaction. Um, so when we are speaking about 4,000 rupees per ton savings, uh, could you please help us understand in which part of the process are we expecting this uh, saving? At a melt shop, melt shop level. Yeah. So, so the idea is that uh, getting the hot metal, uh, molten metal will lead to savings. Is this the energy cost that we are talking about? Uh, Remelting uh, pig iron, is that what we are talking about? Is the saving? Yeah, Vishal, yeah, Vishal this hot metal will not be used directly. It will be first turned into liquid steam. And then this liquid steel will be actually used in the stainless steel manufacturing, in the melt, melting uh, furnace. So definitely what, what we are saying, 4,000 rupees, it will be total direct and indirect savings. Uh, means our, uh, we would be receiving the liquid steel uh, from JUSL or we would be receiving liquid steel, right? We would be receiving liquid steel from JUSL. Okay, after after they turn it into the uh, melt shop, we will we'll be getting the liquid steel. Correct. So. So, uh, instead of buying, let me put it this way, sir, instead of buying uh, uh, a slab, uh, we are uh, purchasing liquid steel so that we can process it through the no, no, AOD no. and make okay. stainless steel. Okay, so let me explain in slightly detail. This liquid steel, what we are going to get is basically plain carbon liquid steel. It will not have any chromium, any manganese, any other alloying element. So, it will be plain carbon steel. This plain carbon steel will be fed into the AOD process, AOD furnace, and there it will be turned into, converted into stainless steel with the refining. We will make additions of chromium, manganese, and whatever alloying elements are required, and then it will be basically turned into stainless steel. It is not mm -hmm. that uh, directly we can uh, actually make it in the stainless steel. It is carbon steel, you know, fed into the stainless steel, AOD converter, and then it is. 
got it. Sir, um, in this context, uh, I'm sure you would have evaluated that instead of uh, putting in an uh, CAPEX and JUSL, um, would it have been more advantageous and cleaner structure to have a smaller electric arc furnace of about you know, 0.6 million tons per annum capacity? That would have served a dual purpose. It would have generated the kind of uh, liquid steel that you would wanted, and and uh, it would have also served as a steel melt shop in terms, you know, whenever you want to uh, have a flexibility in the system. And then obviously you will have no uh, issues with respect to uh, JUSL transaction related party issues, etc. Okay, let me handle the first question uh, you asked. The savings which are getting accrued, they are largely from the raw materials. Energy savings are a small part of it. Okay, so when you say that you can uh, have it by putting up a you know a small electric arc furnace that was well thought of, but because raw material saving was not happening from that, so it was dropped. Second, you know, option was to put up a small blast furnace because we were trying to get a benefit of uh, raw materials. Because so, we are uh, the small blast furnace, we understand it's out of question, sir. Okay, it is out of question. See, what you need to understand is why it cannot be, you know, from electric arc furnace. Because electric arc furnace is not giving you advantage in terms of raw material cost advantage what we are getting from the hot metal. So the large advantage we are having in this scheme of things is uh, hot metal is giving us a huge advantage in terms of cost. That is the thing. Otherwise, but, sir, we this would have been an arm's length transaction. But in an arm's length transaction, we would get the metal at the market prices, so the benefit of raw material will stay with JUSL, right? No, see, uh, at, uh, uh, so let me first uh, tell you, I think it's at least uh, two years away and we have not uh, worked out, but obviously there would be a benefit which will be accruing to JUSL, as I think, even in the current tolling arrangement, and uh, this is all being uh, subject to various audits and all this, because uh, like even in the tolling, they have been doing carbon steel tolling and uh, stainless steel tolling, and we have seen the kind of rate which we are getting as well as compared to even when the market uh, was at the carbon steel market was also up because they were their facilities are also getting completely engaged on those parts. So we will surely get some of the money, but I think it's too early to do because it's at least two fiscal years away. We have been talking about at least uh, FY25 or 26 uh, this type of uh, thing. So we have a time to. Get into this once they conceptualize their full project and how they evolve that. Sure. That's pretty helpful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Vikas Singh with Philip Capital. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Am I audible? Go ahead. Yeah, we can speak. Go ahead. Yeah. Sir, I just wanted to understand, once our new 1.1 million ton SMS would come in, how do our product mix is changing? Because I see that a good part of your our EBITDA improvement is because of the improved product mix, uh, uh, especially in GHSL. So how the combined entity product mix would change in terms of the percentage of value addition and its impact on our EBITDA pattern going forward? See, HR, HR, our JSHN focus will always remain on value added products and our further investment that we have made into uh, precision strips and blade steel, that will always, always uh, remain a margin business. You know, so going forward, uh, in terms of percentage, it would remain the same. Mr. Yeah. Okay, so I'll give you, you are asking specifically this 1.1 to 2.1 when we are going, how much is going to be the change in the product mix? Uh, to tell you the uh, product about the product mix, it is going to remain almost same. Currently, we are having almost 25%, uh, you know, 400 series, 25%, 200 series, and 50%, 300 series. It is largely going to remain same. What will change is the absolute number. 300 series is going to grow. Okay, like in the absolute term, as as the ability was telling, yes, Hitar is being continuously focused on uh, blade steel and prison steel. So there we are focused on value addition. Here it is going to be the same product mix. Uh, what we have been used, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing right now, we would be putting up that only. So even after increase, uh, our understanding is that the mix would uh, not change. Is that a correct understanding? 
Yes, milk food not change, but here what other things would change as we had uh, you know mentioned earlier also since we are putting up a new year PR facility combo facility, our mix of value added will slightly increase. From currently it is about 50 percent, it will go up to say around 65 percent. Understood. And sir, I lost. I actually joined a little bit late because I got dropped. Uh, on your opening remark, I'm not sure whether you have clarified. Just wanted to understand with the uh, nickel prices are behaving so volatile, how's the, our inventory situation right now and have we seen any problems with, with respect to the new order booking on uh, those cities, basically? Okay, since past two months, I think nickel is behaving uh, in a very volatile manner and there are reasons for that. And you know the geopolitical situations and the how you know some Chinese trader has his uh, you know uh, nickel over the LME. Uh, we have all these stories available on the internet and uh, everywhere. So going by that, uh, yes, there was some kind of uh, disruption in the marketplace from the demand side. Also, there was some amount of some kind of confusion from the customer point of view. Okay, but now since Nickel has actually uh, gone into the territory of about uh, 30,000 to 36,000, you know, dollars per ton. It is moving in that fashion. So the, com you know, it is this, uh, you know, uh, nickel is completely de-alienating. Nickel, which is being used in stainless steel manufacturing, is, it is getting dealing from the LMB. Now, this stainless steel business, we are using uh, nickel in the form of a scrap, nickel figure, or uh, uh, ferro nickel. So probably somewhere, if nickel remains in this highly volatile, uh, you know, behaves still in the highly volatile manner, probably uh, uh, it will be totally de-linkage in the future. But what we see in the in the near terms, since there is some confusion and uh, probably you know, uh, there is uh, uh, basically from the demand side, uh, how to put it? Uh, I just. <coughs> You, you want to pitch in because I'm slightly confused. There is, there is a small confusion in the demand side and uh, probably somewhere from the customer angle, probably that demand is not getting picked up. So, so the point you are trying to make is that uh, how we are actually you know, trying to... Coping up with this situation. Pardon me? So what I want to exactly know that how we are coping up with this situation, what kind of the impact we are witnessing right now, and uh, exactly what are the steps uh, we are taking to cope up? Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it is getting bailing, and our manufacturing is based on scrap and uh, nickel figure and ferro nickel. So we are not into that kind of a thing, and uh, our 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 manufacturing is largely based on that. So from the cost point of view, we are well under control, and uh, uh, by using these type of uh, you know raw materials and uh, these type of nickel variants. Uh, sorry, sir, I did not understand. Uh, basically, what I wanted to understand is uh, uh, how much of the volume has been impacted How on those series and uh, exactly had we seen any improvement because now it seems to be stabilizing. So the, the lost volume, some part of it is coming back to us or is still uh, uh, the market is confused state and uh, it would take time to normalize. Okay, just to give you the background, see, there is a little bit of lull in the market side, okay? So, there has been a slight, uh, there has been some slowness in the market side when we talk of 300 series. But, but the market has a demand of 200 and uh, 400 series and market is demanding uh, material in these series. So, when nickel is behaving in this session, though we are losing, uh, you know, uh, so, so what happens is that whenever you are actually whenever there is a volatility, the buying pattern just typically take a, a bit of a, a, a pause and open pause and open sort of situation because market uh, also customers get confused, especially in the because nickel is mostly largely as a bearing on 300 series. So in terms of their buying uh, decisions on this, so either some these talking happen for some time and then, but. When this volatility happens, largely I think we have not cancelled any single order. Let me tell you, I think we were doing the back-to-back -back coverage of our raw material. And we were catering to all the orders uh, as committed. In fact, uh, some of the European players, what we that they we changed, we priced the orders later on. But uh, in our case, uh, because uh, some of the volumes could be uh, like uh, 
for a time being there was uh, obviously for 300 series was there overall demand continue but overall i think in a full year basis we are uh, 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 confident that we will meet the full volume that's not uh, becoming a challenge so it's not a demand which is uh, giving us the challenge it's more the buying uh, pattern at that particular volatile period it always happens uh, it's a unique situation in the world right now which has never been faced by the sustainability industry so the concept that the whole world is working on is on lean inventory no one in the system is talking everyone is definitely aware that there is huge volatility of nickel chrome uh, mild steel scrap sf scrap also so everyone is working on lean inventory low inventory model but we really feel it's only for the next uh, uh, maybe in this quarter only then again it will stabilize because the world cannot operate in this uh, in this fashion at all so it's a very unique uh, period that this has happened it's a unique situation in the whole world uh compounding with the russia ukraine factor also so but by a few one we think this whole thing should stabilize and it should be normal course of business after that understood sir so just one more uh, uh, just one last question in terms of scrap availability uh, and the logistics of it uh, so we are hearing a lot of uh, things uh, regarding the tight availability uh, uh, etc so if you could just uh, explain a little bit on that how are we placed in terms of that uh, have we facing any difficulty in terms of uh, procurement of scraps etc so not at all in terms of availability because of the kind of uh, uh, partners and the supply chain that we have created uh, you know we are very again very flexible we have uh, traders our partners all across the globe focus is always domestic and southeast asia nearby countries which is exactly where even till now we are able to uh, get all our scrap requirements so from a raw material perspective uh, we are in a very comfortable position understood sir thank you for answering my question and all the best for future thank you thank you our next question is from rithvik with one up financial consultants private limited please go ahead sir yeah uh, hi uh, good evening and uh, congrats on a great uh, fi22 uh, so i have a few questions uh, firstly uh, you, you mentioned that us we have uh, tripled the volumes in fi22 so uh, is it possible to quantify on an absolute basis and where do you think uh, this will move over the next 3 uh, 3 years yes for three years I think uh, see uh, US being one of our target markets if I can tell you it's very difficult to say 3 year time what is our exact uh, targeted figures but this year because uh, see uh, the geographically and the fact that we keep uh, because being a agile and uh, flexibility in our product range and geography we keep changing this how the pair ever we keep getting the better margin order so uh, just to give you the perspective overall uh, in jsl uh, the large part of the us order which we cater typically uh, the quarter four uh, the our export mix was 32% of our say, total sales volume and uh, the uh, on a full year basis it was 25% uh, and last year it was 19% now out of 25% this year other uh, 15% came from us okay so that was the statistic of the jsl uh, volume yes so almost 15% of the jsl volumes were actually from us market okay okay sure so it would be close to 40 45000 uh, of volume in jsl yeah Sure, sure. Okay. No, no. The reason I'm asking is that you know, in the last couple of quarters, you have mentioned that uh, we want to scale up in US market. So you know, uh, uh, that would be a, a good uh, diversification and added geography, uh, given the imports are uh, coming in the country. So just wanted to get a sense from where this you know, forty thousand tons will move over the next uh, three years, especially when uh, we are doubling our capacity at JSL. so so would it so, be fair see uh, just to correct i think uh, it was not on combined volume it was on actually on jsl volume what i said i was mentioning the jsl volume which yeah. is close to 1.01 million and the 15% of was the actually us that's coming from us market right right okay so 15% of the total jsl volume is from the us market 
of the 10 percent of the export. 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 And uh, so, uh, uh, with this expansion on track uh, by FI23, and we should uh, we we would have commissioned uh, the capacity at GSL. So, uh, when in your sense uh, we can ramp up this to uh, full utilization, and you know, given the fact that uh, a million ton, uh, we would have to uh, look for uh, incremental uh, for uh, probably new geographies as well. uh since it's a, a, a decent uh, enough volume for us to sell so it would take about almost a year's time to commission to full capacity okay. and uh, we see enough demand there is good growth stainless steel is the fastest growing metal is also almost growing at about 9% domestically itself mm -hmm. uh, and we see the usage is only increasing like in infrastructure Which was totally dominated by concrete and uh, steel. Now you're going to see stainless steel having a very, very major role to play. Uh, like I mentioned already, uh, we built our first asset uh, put over bridge uh, and tune like that. Twenty bridges itself this year are planned, plus another three hundred more in the pipeline. You know, so in terms of uh, our one million ton capacity, domestic we see good growth coming in in high end segments mm -hmm. in your process industries. And similarly, like we mentioned, US is going to be a target market for us. So there, we further want to increase uh, year-on-year basis. Sure, sure. And and just one uh, last clarification: you know, there are a lot of questions on JUSL expansion. Uh, so this two million ton expansion is a incremental expansion, or right now I believe it's one million ton, which will go to two million tons over next two to three years. Or uh, it's uh, separate, two million tons additional. additional okay and and so they would have some kind of cash flows as well right uh, since uh, they have a million ton uh, capacity right now uh, so they would have their cash flows and this 2500 capex over next 2 to 3 years so that so uh, would it be fair to assume that the uh, cash flows 40 50% of the capex requirement would be funded from internal accruals Large part of yes because see they have a 1.6 million ton uh, capacity of quarter strip mill right now which they are increasing to 3.2 separately. Okay. So they will have their own uh, tolling uh, revenue plus uh, JCL mineral coke which is also sell sell the coco one uh, also so that also uh, uh, is uh, actually getting merged. So they uh, they combined they will have a LG cash flow. And they don't have a much of the debt liabilities at this stage for next three four years. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Maybe I I I'll take this offline. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sir, thank you, and all the best. Thank you. Our next question is from Ashish Kejriwal with Centrum Broking. Please go ahead, sir. Please. three questions for me uh, one is uh, we have seen in fy22 that you know, a lot a part of our earnings got captured in working capital and because of that fact we are unable to reduce our debt so uh, first is where we are in the working capital cycle do we think that that is going to ease from the current level or it will increase or how it is second is uh, uh, is it possible to give a uh, cash flow capex guidance for fy23 because in fy22 i think we have spent only 750 crore so how the capex uh, will happen in fy23 when we are going to finish all the project and third you mentioned about the dividend policy but uh, is it possible that we can have some elaborative capital allocation policy because you know maybe in a year or two years time framework we will be debt free so you know it's very important for us to understand what our thought process is going forward in terms of capital allocation thank you so let okay actually let me answer one so working capital uh, is purely because of the function of the uh, raw material prices and uh, if the prices comes down it will immediately ease out so uh, because uh, the, our increase is purely purely linked with the higher raw material prices because the volumes are also actually at a peak level so uh, so it's uh, 
it's not possible to give the commitment number because if the raw metal prices remain high, this will remain at the same level. But if it comes down to half, our working capital requirement, we have seen that in the past also, immediately it will come down drastically because uh, it's only the deployment which will have to do primarily for the inventory purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the whole uh, working capital side uh, because it's, uh, I mean, it's not right for us to predict the raw material pressure because we, our focus is always to have a just complete risk management strategy. So we keep uh, balancing between our sales and the uh, sourcing, so not to take up any of the commodity exposure of others. Uh, because on the end, just on this uh, working capital only, uh, what we are he seeing is in FY22, number of days of inventory has reduced drastically. Despite this fact, this is happening. So I don't know how, first of all, this number of days has declined so drastically in FY22. And despite that, we are having such working capital pressure. See, uh, because if you see the underlying raw material prices have increased considerably. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's uh, because uh, when you look at just on a one point two point number because the average deployment comes on the previous uh, when you close that it's because of the previous uh, almost a three months average basis okay so, uh, raw material prices have increased it's purely reflection of prices that's what I said See, the moment it comes down so our days we are keeping a very close check so we are mm -hmm. not increasing neither we are increasing our exposures in terms of the, any of the underlying commodity that's what our prime focus is and uh, data days are also completely remain under control. So it's not the, the increase is not per, uh, pursuant to the increase in uh, changes in the days. It's purely because of the prices which we have to maintain. Depending on that, also depends on the particular series. So if you have a larger 300 series uh, uh, campaigns uh, going on at that particular point of time at the end of the quarter, you will see a much higher inventories at that point of time because. That we are seeing when most of the export order was being catered from 300 series. So therefore you will see a large uh, inventory. But if similar thing happens say 400 series, then again uh, it will be a different inventory level at, uh, in all. Sure. Okay, so and CapEx side, uh, so out of the total committed CapEx of 2600 crore, uh, we spent close to 950 or close to 1000 crore in uh, FY22. And FY23 this year, we expect close to 1200 because some of the spillover capex of the last year will come because mm -hmm. we earlier guided you from for uh, close to 1100 crore capex. Mm -hmm. And this year, we expect close to 1200 crore to 1300 crore of the capex as we are finishing the project. Uh, maintenance capex will be separate, uh, which uh, we say which will uh, range between the 300 to 400 crore range. Because this is you are talking about the combined entity, yes? Combined entity, combined entity, right. Okay, okay. On uh, dividend or if you say the shareholders return policy, uh, this is uh, mostly because whether in the form of, uh, whether in what form we will get to this, uh, this, this has to be decided at the time by the board at the time when they uh, get to this. Uh, but idea was that too because earlier we were having a uh, very generic dividend policy, the board deliberated this and since we uh, they, depending on our earnings and all these things, we then have give, uh, decided that uh, board uh, took a decision that we progressively we should target to reach towards 20 percent of the shareholders' return. So uh, I was looking at more of capital allocation policy, uh, which uh, dividend policy could be a part of it. But what could be our strategic uh, capital allocation policy? Let's say by you know uh, free cash flows, uh, how you want to distribute it in terms of growth, in terms of deleveraging, in terms of uh, dividend distribution. Is there any policy which is in our mind? Uh, sure, that's a good suggestion. Uh, I think early, I think uh, once we, uh, because this year we once we uh, complete the deployment of this capex, so I think uh, then uh, there was some time, I think by the end of next fiscal year, we'll see that how we should evolve this because once... Uh, our this capex, uh, current capex cycle uh, gets over by end of the next this fiscal year. Sure, sure. Thanks and all the best. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Due to time constraint, this will be the last question. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Vishal Chandak for closing comments. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, joining in for today's call. Uh, I think this was a very healthy and lively discussion. Um, I would request uh, Mr. Abhitay Jindal for his closing remarks. Uh, 
Over to you, sir. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone for attending this call. Despite many challenges from raw material price volatility to supply chain disruption to geopolitical tension, tensions, our robust performance is a testimony to our agile and focused business strategy. Prudent financial management has been complementing strong operational performance. I hope we have been able to answer all your questions. Uh, should you have any further clarification or would like to know more about the company, please feel free to contact our investor relations team. And uh, we have taken note of all the questions and all the concerns. So definitely in the next call, we will try to answer in a more detailed uh, fashion. So thank you once again for taking out the time to join us on this call and stay safe. Thank you. On behalf of Motilal Oswal, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.